All right, moving on from properties and behaviors of water, um, as well as our um, discussion of turgidity within plant cells and their advantages, which we, we listed in various advantages here. Uh, one more advantage that we're going to really spend some time on here is that um, water basically contributes to a measurement that is um, used to just to predict the move to the movement of water called water potential. So we're going to spend uh, the next couple of video um, as lectures on the concept of water potential. Um, basically plants move down a gradient of water potential and water potential as we'll s discuss in detail here is the um, the free energy of water molecules from basically one place to another. All right. We're going to skip a slide here and go into this figure that you might recall that demonstrates um, some ways that water moves between plant cells. So her, our question here that we can refer to is how does water move from cell to cell in plants. That's what we're concentrating on here. And I want to stress that we're talking about cell to cell. Um, there are some longer distant transport um, mechanisms that we'll be sort of uh, expanding into after we understand how water moves from cell to cell. So the main idea that we're looking at here in this figure is that water moves by the process of diffusion and you should remember what um, diffusion is. Water moves um, by diffusion across a selectively permeable membrane or semi-permeable Um, and that diff diffusion across a selectively permeable membrane is referred to as passive transport. Meaning that it doesn't require an internal um, metabolic source of energy. So in the first um, part of this diagram, uh, you should recognize simple diffusion where these molecules or solutes are simply crossing the, plat the uh, phospholipid bilayer from an area uh, where you see more uh, molecules here present compared to the few that are on the other side of the membrane. Um, and so that would be characteristic um, of a hydrophobic solute or substance. In the next uh, image here, I'll write it down here, we're looking at a transmembrane protein that serves as a channel through which hydrophilic ions or substances can pass across the membrane. So here's a channel protein and here we see a conformational change that results uh, in the passage of um, uh, solutes across the plasma membrane and this would be what an example of a carrier protein. And these are again, uh, let's see, these are again um, diff examples of diffusion across the membrane, which means that it doesn't require metabolic energy or an internal source of energy, cellular energy. Um, mainly, we're talking about ATP. Okay, so let's let's take a look here at diffusion and. Um, ask ourselves basically what are some factors or the factors that influence the rate of diffusion across membranes or just the rate of diffusion in general. 
And we can answer that question by looking at uh, fix first law, which describes um, the rate of diffusion based on various factors. So we're going to write out this equation here. Js equals <coughs> negative d sub s here times a and we've got delta C over L. And this is like a lowercase cursive L. <coughs> um, J sub S refers to, the, uh, refers to the rate of diffusion. D sub S here is referred to as the diffusion coefficient and the diffusion coefficient is affected by various factors such as the temperature of the medium through which um, a substance is diffusion, diffu diffusing. Uh, it's also affected by the size of the molecule and um, also by the um, the nature of the medium. So the, the, the nature of the medium, the temperature of the medium um, through which a molecule is diffusion, diffusing and by the size of the molecule. Um, <clears throat> we also want to note this negative sign here, um, which is going to make uh, basically this whole equation um, inversely related to the rate of diffusion. All right, A, we're going to point way over here, is the cross-sectional area of the diffusional path. We don't spend so much time talking about cross-sectional area. We do spend more time discussing the effect of delta C, which is the concentration gradient. And you probably remember that that effect on diffusion looking uh, back at your introductory biology courses and so forth. And so just as a reminder, the concentration gradient is basically the concentration at point A minus the concentration at point B, so that difference there. And then L refers to the length of the diffusional path. Okay. So what this equation shows us is that based on sort of concentrating on um, delta C over L, the larger the concentration gradient, let's kind of, an increase in concentration gradient has what effect on the rate of diffusion? And, uh, and let's say if the concentration gradient was held constant, how about an increase in the length of the diffusional path? What effect would that have on the rate of diffusion. Well, the longer, the, the larger the concentration gradient, um, because this is sort of in the numerator of this um, relationship, um, the larger the concentration gradient, then the faster the rate of diffusion. Um, the larger the le length of the diffusional path, because that length of the diffusional path is in the, in the denominator of this relationship here, then it's going to have an, the opposite effect on um, the rate of diffusion. So the longer the, dif the length of the diffusional path, the, the, sh the slower the rate of diffusion. Okay, and as we mentioned, the negative sign here creates a negative relationship between this whole, relation, uh, this whole uh, equation and the rate of diffusion. So when we're looking at, um, when we're actually looking at measurements of biologically relevant distances, um, diffusion, is fairly rapid over short distances. And slower, obviously the opposite here would be too, true, slower over longer distances. As an example, we can use um, 
glucose. So glucose diffuses through water at a rate of 10 to the negative ninth or 10 billion or one um, one billionth of a meter per second. So when we're looking at cellular distances, let's say a cell is um, has a diameter of 50 microns or uh, micrometers. Let's see diameter. It takes glucose about um, two and a half seconds to cross the cell wall, to, to cross the cell rather. Now if we were looking at glucose diffusing through a cell, um, let's sort of pretend we're copying all this, of one meter diameter. I forgot to write diameter up here. It would take glucose basically 32 years to cross the cell. So the po moral of the story here is that diffusion is a very effective um, method or mechanism of transport for water at cellular levels. But when we're looking at longer distances, and as we know trees are many meters high, um, then diffusion doesn't become so efficient or effective. And so we'll get into um, a discussion of the kinds of uh, mechanisms there at larger distances, and dx is abbreviation for distance, um, bulk flow becomes um, more effective for water transport to transport water. And so, for example, we're looking at maybe the movement of, of water through xylem in that case. But that's a discussion for another topic there. All right, so we've talked about diffusion. We've talked about factors that affect uh, diffusion. And I'm just gonna and so when we're looking at cells, we're, we're, um, we want to make sure that we know the mechanism or the term that's used to describe the movement of water down a concentration gradient, which is osmosis. So to define osmosis, we're looking at the diffusion of water across a selectively permeable membrane that is impermeable to solutes or certain solutes. And this is going to become more biologically relevant when it comes to a discussion of um, movement of water through plant cells. So we'll continue that topic in the next um, video clip.